Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews and Shebrews, welcome to the Life Podcast. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Jake Hilton. He is the creator of Sword of Yahovah, a YouTube channel and teaching series. And he is now kind of the new face of a rude awakening. And we're going to talk to him all about his past and how he grew up as a Mormon and is in fact, I believe, the seventh generation Mormon. He's maybe the only one in his family who's not a Mormon anymore. We'll talk to him all about the difficulty of leaving that religion, which he said is indoctrinating children since they were born. Well, since they were toddlers. So we're going to talk all about that journey and how he found the Torah. And we're going to talk about his life now, his work at Sword of Yahovah and his work with A Rude Awakening. And it's a quite entertaining and enlightening discussion, I believe. Especially if you or anyone who had Mormons come and visit you at your door. These young pair of 18, 19, or 20 year olds who are knocking on your door and trying to tell you about the Mormon religion. And he's going to talk to you about how to receive them. And the not only the kind and loving way to talk with them, but maybe about some things that might get through to them. So without further ado, I give you Jake. Jake, welcome to the Life Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for the invite, man. And I know this is uh, when I got the invite from you, you know, a couple weeks back, I went, I checked out your ministry online and I got to tell you, the first thing that I thought of you when I saw you and I heard your voice, I'm like, this is a man who's got a radio voice. This you like you you have a you have a talent from God. You've got the voice and you're using it for God and that's exactly what you should be doing. So, hey, bravo, man. I love it. Oh, praise you. You do too. You got a great voice and you got the you got the mic too. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say like Love you, man. And you do got the voice. And so you're doing you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. I can tell you that. <laughs> hey, thanks, Jake. That's very encouraging. I appreciate it. Well, <laughs> all right. Some some people, many people probably will already know who you are. But for anyone who doesn't, will you tell just give us a brief who is Jake Hilton? And also, I, I of course, want to get to your testimony because I know it's going to be so good. So <laughs> we can get into that, too. All right. Well, brief I, I tell you um brevity brevity brief. is not one of my uh my my <laughs> talents uh, um, we got if, all the time in the world man. okay yeah if you if you give me the floor i'll, I'll take it so um who is jake hilton all right well my story begins in um it was january 6th of 1984 I'm born in Salt Lake City, Utah, and for those who know, Salt Lake City, Utah is not just an area where Mormonism is the dominant primary religion, but Salt Lake City, Utah is in fact the headquarters for Mormonism globally. It's like it's like the capital of Mormonism, quite literally. And I mean, and it is sad. It is incredibly sad. This is a bit of a tangent, and I'll get back to the main story beyond this. But it is sad how in these last, I want to say, 30-ish years, maybe 40 years at most, Salt Lake City has become exceptionally wicked, uh, liberal, embracing all sorts of uh, really the, the most vile and disgusting sexual perversions there are. I mean... Over this last 10 years in particularly, uh, 12 years actually, since 2012, Salt Lake City has numerous times won the award, if you will, of being the most, um, how to say it, what, what's the reward? Basically, the most pro-LGBT, gay, homosexual capital in the United States. 
beating e- beating even cities like San Francisco and Portland and Seattle, uh, New York, Chicago. It, it's it's crazy. I think it's won it like three or four times. You know, it, it's that's so surprising. And, and, oh, it it is. It is very surprising because Mormonism. You got to give credit where credit is due. At the very least, Mormonism for its history has been very pro family, nuclear family, uh, uh, one man, one woman, husband and wife. Okay. I say one man and one woman. Okay. Technically, <laughs> you got to, <laughs> that really only is uh, basically 20th century and beyond. <laughs> because when you go back into the 19th century, the 1800s, yes, polygamy was very much so a thing in Mormonism. Uh, not everyone practiced it, but uh, it was one of those things that the top leaders of the LDS Church practiced it, like the top 3%. Um, and that's that's just vile in and of itself. Obviously, it's just, you know, uh, that is, is an abomination. But uh, Salt Lake City, at least when I was born in 1984, it was a relatively, if not very conservative, um, st- strong place to, to be raised with those family values you could you know judeo-christian family values however mormonism being what it is it is a uh, false religion a man-made religion that was established by the very much so false prophet joseph smith jr in 1830 he he started his work to establish it years previous in the 1820s but it was officially established in 1830, April 6th of 1830, and its official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So January 6th, 1984, I'm born into Salt Lake City to mother and father that are Mormon, have been Mormon their entire lives, born and raised, grandparents born and raised, great-grandparents. My, my family line on both sides, father and mother's side, we're talking all of them are Mormon going back to the founding of Mormonism in the 1830s. So almost oh. 200 years of Mormonism is in my family line, my family's DNA, blood. Uh, and I was, I'm actually a seventh generation Mormon. And, you know, we'll get into this, you know, a little bit, you know, as, as we continue in this, uh, the show, but as far as I am aware, now, I could be wrong on this, but as far as I'm aware, I am the only member of my family thus far in both immediate relation and also distant relations, so un- uncles, aunts, cousins, all of those, nieces, nephews, I am the only member of my entire family that has left Mormonism strictly for biblical reasons, you know, because I sought truth. I opened up the Word of God, the Holy Bible, and I studied it, and I just really dove down as deep as I could possibly as 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 deep as I was allowed to you know by the grace of God and then I began weighing the two and ultimately realized wow these are not the same and so I'm going to make that decision I'm going to embrace the truth of God's word and I'm going to throw out the the false religion and that was a decision I made many years ago and haven't regretted it one moment, not one day. In fact, I've given praise to God, you know, every day that uh, he brought me out of false religion and into true relationship with him. Mormons aren't allowed coffee, but for everyone else, this episode of The Life Podcast is sponsored by Shepherd's Crook Coffee. If you go to shepherdscrookcoffee.com, you'll get 25% off your first order with code THE LIFE. You may not know this because I haven't shared it on the podcast, but I'm really into coffee. Here in rural Ohio, I'm very limited on finding organic dark roast coffee beans. And so at Kroger's, my options are pre-ground Pete's dark roast and Death Wish whole bean, but the beans are all crumbled up and there's an evil skull on the front of the bag and it's 20 bucks a bag. My mom won't buy Death Wish coffee because of the skull. Shepherd's Crook Coffee is a Torah observant coffee roasting small business that only buys organic beans. Some of the beans they buy are not certified organic, but owners Greg and Laura make sure that the growers are following organic processes, whether they're too small to have the certification or not. Getting you the healthy beans that you want at $11.99 a bag. 
Plus, with the 25% off that you get with code THE LIFE, it's $8.99 a bag, and it's glorious. Look at this coffee. Look at the crema on this thing. It's gorgeous. These are the options I see. One, support evil Starbucks with their evil pagan mermaid. Or you can support a Tura run family-owned business that will ship you fresh roasted beans directly to your door for pretty much the same price. $8.99 with this 25% off code. Make sure you get enough for your whole Shabbat group. Get the big bags, baby. Go to shepherdscrookcoffee.com. Put in code the life for 25% off. How, how did you, oh, can you tell us about that then? How, can you put us in your shoes back when you were just a Mormon? You grew up as a Mormon. It was normal, the normal life. And then what was the uh, impetus to look into the faith at all? I, why didn't you just continue as a Mormon for the rest of your life? Oh my goodness. Wow. Who was okay. the match? So... The match strike. The, you know, in... <laughs> I mean, if we're going to, yeah, like the, the whole story is, um, I think a lot of it just has to, it has to start with just my personality is I've always been the type of personality that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it because I want to do it. Not because somebody is compelling me to do it, uh, even trying to force me to do it. It's just, if, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be, this is what I want to do, because for whatever reason, I see, I see the value in doing it. Like, and call it stubbornness, call it whatever you will. It's like, mom, dad, they, they couldn't get me, force me to do anything that I didn't want to do. <laughs> and, and, and that, that's, that's on me because I do strongly encourage everybody, hey, honor your father and mother and obey your parents. That's pleasing to God, 100%. But still, it's just a, a part of my personality that I've received from God Almighty. And it's funny because my parents recognized this about me when I was born. Like, I'm minutes old, right? So born in the Salt Lake City, Utah hospital. I come out of my mom. They put me on the table. They're cleaning me off. And the doctors, they uh, take a, an oxygen mask. You know, I, I was born healthy, but, you know, this is just the practice, you know, that they do. They took an oxygen mask and they put it on my face to provide oxygen, you know, to me, a one-minute old baby. And I kid you not, uh, I have no memory of this, but my parents, uh, you know, they they swear that this is exactly what happened. They watched as I reached up with these little one minute old you know hands and arms i grabbed the mask and i shoved it off my face <laughs> no way and I, I i it's and they're just like what and then the doctor is like oh he put grabbed the mask and he put it back on i'm like nope and i grabbed it and shoved it off my face <laughs> and I, I i always thought that was a funny story particularly in these last several years when you have the government coming out and all these pharmaceutical groups and all these leftist loonies and they're they're pushing forcing so many people hey you got to wear this diaper on your face you got to wear this mask you've got to double mask and you got to get the fauci ouchy and all this and i'm just like no <laughs> i refuse i it's like they couldn't put a mask on my face when i was one minute old do you think they're gonna put a mask on my face now <laughs> It's like there's no way. I'm just like <laughs> they've been that's trying just to not... mask you, and Jake, for the for decades. <laughs> it's like you're not gonna you're not gonna force me to do anything that I don't want to do. That's just it's just who I am, and I think that's just where it has to it has to start there. But nevertheless, even if you have a personality like that, you still grow up in a very much so man made religion where the the practices of the leadership of the church, there's very much so uh, Soviet Union, North Korean style indoctrination that goes on. I mean, it's it's very, from the cradle, quite literally from the cradle, there are just certain ideas that they just impress into your heart and into your mind that this is the way it is, this is the truth, this is the one and only true religion, one and only true church, all other religions are an abomination. Yes, that's official Mormon doctrine. 
and and a little tangent here, but I, I just got to stress this. Whenever I do talk about my story and the problems in Mormonism, I'm always stressing it's Mormonism that's the problem, and those at the top leadership of the church. They're the problem because they're perpetuating the lies. I don't attack Mormons. In fact, I have a great compassion and love for who I consider to be my people. You know, they're, they're my family, they're my friends. You know, I, so I have a great love for Mormons, and in fact, uh, uh, a desire to reach Mormons with the truth. And so I just need to make that yeah. distinction. I'm not, I'm not attacking Mormons. It's the religion, and it's the leadership that is perpetuating that religion. That's the issue. And later on, I want, so, I want you to tell us, don't let me forget about how people should react properly when Mormons come and visit them. Let's not, we shouldn't talk about it now, but we should. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, let, you, you just stimulate the brain up here and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a, you know, at, at a later time. Yeah. You just, you just let me know, but yeah, it's, I did have one question for you to, okay. Yeah. You, you mentioned What's your question? that it, it's like, it was, very much indoctrination. And do you remember any scenarios that might show that at all? Do you remember any any things like I wanted to say? How was it indoctrination? You know what? Okay. What sort of well, it's examples maybe might come to mind. Okay. okay. Well, when you're when you're a little kid, you know, two, three, four years old, you don't have the mental capacity to question what it is you're being told. You just don't. You, you, you believe what it is you're told. And certain things that, certain doctrines of Mormonism that are repeated all the time, we're talking weekly, if not multiple times per week, because it's not just, it's not just going to church, it's also going to, uh, you know, it, it's your family that are teaching these same things, you know, repeating these same things. And also when you get to middle school and then beyond, middle school, high school, and even at college level, there's what's called seminary. And then in the university level, there's what's called institute, where it's, it's con this continuation, even on a daily basis, of Mormon teachings and Mormon doctrines. And so from the youngest age, you are taught that the leadership of the LDS Church, they are all prophets, seers, and revelators of God Almighty. You're taught that, that these men, they basically have face-to-face -face conversations with God and with Christ, that Jesus is the head of the Church, He is leading the Church, and second, that it is, not only is it inappropriate to question the leadership, but it is wrong. It is sinful to question them. When you get to a point later in life, say at the age of 18 or 19, and you now have an opportunity to go into the, the Mormon temples, uh, which, and this is another thing that I'll be saying throughout this. So the official name, as I said before, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The abbreviated name is the LDS Church, Latter-day Saint Church. So whether I say the full name or whether I say LDS or whether I say Mormon, I'm obviously referring to the same organization. But you have the LDS temples, or the Mormon temples, and one of the questions you are required to answer in the affirmative that you, you do uh, uphold the leaders of the LDS Church as prophets, seers, and revelators, you have to say yes to even be allowed to enter the LDS temples. So if you even are questioning the leadership, then it's like, they you you can't you can't progress in mormonism and then of course it gets to the lds temples where the doctrine that's taught is that the the ceremonies and the uh the covenants and ordinances that you engage in and enter into in the mormon temples they are absolutely required for your salvation they 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 refer to them as saving ordinances that if you do not, that if you do not go through these Mormon temples, then you literally cannot be saved. That's just that's that's the doctrine of Mormonism, and then this is where the whole uh, other doctrines of Mormonism come in, like baptism for the dead thing, where for those who may be like unfamiliar with this, like well, what is that? What is that? It's it's not like Mormons are literally you know baptizing the dead. No, but you get baptized in LDS temples 
by proxy for those that have passed on, right? Your your deceased ancestry. Basically, anyone through ancestral lines or genealogical work that you can find that you that was not a Mormon, and so this includes literally all of the human race before 1830, then you find their records, you find out who these people were, you print that information out, and then you, acting as if you were them, you get baptized on their behalf, you go through these other temple ceremonies on their behalf, because the doctrine is that you are providing basically salvation or the opportunity for salvation to these people that have passed on. Doesn't matter if they were, uh, you know, a, a righteous individual in the past. Doesn't matter if they believed in Yehovah God Almighty. Doesn't matter if they were Christian, they believed in God's Son, Yeshua. None of that matters. They weren't LDS. They weren't Mormon. They did not actually go through these, these temple ceremonies. So they cannot be saved until they receive these things. Wow. Now, now you can like see some of the not not just indoctrination, but you can see how how genuinely blasphemous you know these these doctrines are. You know these are these are uh, straight up heresies, just total heresies. Is that part of why Ancestry dot com or whatever is is based in Salt Lake City? I believe it's. Oh, totally, absolutely, yeah. the The LDS Church has done more for genealogical and ancestral type of research than literally any other organization on planet earth. And I, I don't, there's obviously nothing wrong with, you know, finding out who your, your ancestors were, you know, doing that type of research. I think that's fantastic. Great. If you want to, for whatever reason, want to chart out your ancestry going back 20, 50, hundred generations. Well, Great. I mean, the, the ancient Hebrews, you know, kept, you know, uh, uh, strict genealogical records. The Jews, even to this day, keep very strict genealogical records. That's fine. That's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But the reason, the motive behind the LDS Church doing all their genealogical work is to perform these, these uh, ordinances on behalf of those that have passed on, because there's this idea hey, we are serving those that have passed on. We're offering them this, this salvation. Wow. Okay, so getting back to you know some of the indoctrination. So from the cradle, you are taught that the leaders are prophets, seers, and revelators. You are taught that you cannot even question them. It's sinful to question them. And if you ever belong to any type of organization where you are told you can't question the leadership— that's a red flag, like right there. I mean, that's alarm bells should be going off. That's a red flag. So, um, you are taught that. So this is a this is a huge one that wasn't taught originally, but began to be taught at the end of the eighteen hundreds. Uh, so this is now about a maybe a hundred and thirty year old false doctrine of the LDS Church that the leadership will not and cannot lead. The membership astray. Like it is literally impossible for those so called prophets that lead the LDS Church, and at any given time, there's 15 of them. There's the head prophet and then his two counselors. So that's called the first presidency. So there's three there. And then there's the 12 beneath them, the, the 12 quote apostles, right? So a total of 15, you know, men at any given time that are leading the LDS Church. And the doctrine is they will not and cannot lead the membership astray, which you just take those things from a little, you know, a little kid. And those are the things that are being drilled into your mind every week, if not every day. That's indoctrination. I mean, that's that's the same kind of indoctrination that the North Koreans are subject to when it comes to, you know, the, the Kim you know, Kim Jong -un. Uh, regime, you know, that, that, that family dynasty of mass murderers and just the absolute scum of the earth, Th the citizens of North Korea are told you can, that, you know, Kim Jong Sung or Sung and then Il and then Un, this, you know, current, you know, leader, you can't question him. You have to revere him. You have to honor him. You have to follow him. You have to obey him uh, there. And if you do question him, well, they take it to the extreme, the communist level, that if you do question him, well, then it's your life. You're like, we, we will literally kill you if you question him. Obviously, the LDS Church doesn't do that. 
at least not today. <clears throat> There is evidence that they did do that in the past. <laughs> yeah, um, there is evidence they did do that in the past. So the first, uh, the founder and first president of the church was Joseph Smith Jr. The second who followed him was Brigham Young. And there's, oh yeah, there's definitely a lot of historical evidence that Brigham Young had basically a, a hit squad. Like, you know, he had his like own team of assassins the angels of something like uh, that. that do you remember what they were called weren't they called the the something or other angel i'm getting this from well, from sherlock holmes there was I, a I, short I, sherlock holmes story called the five orange no i can't remember what it was it was the first one the sign of four maybe anyway it it, it deals with sure. the lds church way back in the day way back when when Co Arthur Conan Doyle was writing it. Anyway, that's neither here nor there, Jake. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's disturbing and yet fascinating history. And when you look into these things, because, uh, so Brigham Young, the second, uh, leader of the LDS church, he has these, uh, individuals around him where there was definitely this air of a fear that was being spread throughout all of, you know, the Mormons, the, all the membership that you, never go against Brigham Young. You never question him because, and he said this himself, this is recorded, that uh, if he, you know, the, the power that he holds just in his little pinky to have his, you know, his will be done, like, you better beware that if he ever, you know, moves his little pinky in your direction, then you could be like, and, and, and even one of my own ancestors was one of these individuals. So my... Who would be? It would be my third great grandfather on my father's mother's side of the family. So my grandmother's side of the family, going back, third great grandfather, his name was William Hickman, but he was known as Wild Bill Hickman. That's what everyone referred to him as Wild Bill. And he was actually given the uh the title of Brigham's Brigham Young's destroying angel. Destroying angels. So, that's what he said in Sherlock Holmes. I, I oh, think. There you go. That that's the that is reference to my third great grandfather. No <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's like it's it's crazy, but yes. Um. That's that's Wild Bill Hickman, and he was one of Brigham's quote destroying angels. So it, it's just it, it's it's nuts. So getting back to modern <laughs> day time, no, th they won't. They won't kill you now for, you know, questioning the leadership, but uh, shunning, um, basically crucifying you culturally and socially. I mean, and th these are more of the, the type of things, you know, that happen now where and, – and this is where my eyes really began to be open to these types of issues. So I turned 19 years old. Which is crazy the thought that's 21 years ago good time keeps <laughs> rolling man <laughs> oh man it it keeps going and it's just like we got this little dash between those two dates on our tombstone and it's like let's just make sure we're dedicating that dash to god so 21 years ago i turned 19 and now it's my time to uh serve a mormon mission you know two-year mission you go out you you serve the LDS church you you go among you know, uh, a foreign people, you know, is often the case as it was mine. I served in Hong Kong, China. So I had to learn Cantonese, Chinese, uh, went out, served among the Chinese people. And overall, there was there was many aspects about that that mission that was that was a blessing. In, in fact, I think one of the greatest things about it is that it forces these young men to actually you got to become a man like, OK, Imagine being 18 or 19 years old, especially for kids today that, you know, in so many ways are so immature. And they, you know, these are kids that, you know, their mom is still doing their laundry. And, you know, their mom is doing the dishes for them and, you know, taking care of them in every way, shape and form. And it's like, okay, now you need to leave the familiarity of mom and dad and friends and family and all the comforts of home. And you need to go out to, a, you know, learn a brand new language and go out among strange people and share with them this message of Jesus as Mormons understand Jesus. You just need to go out and share that message with, you know, wherever the church leadership sends you. That that does take actually a 
I'd say a tremendous amount of courage. And so I, I, I got to, you know, commend these, you know, young men and young women that go out and do serve an LDS mission because, and th this is something that I've, um, I'm actually with a Root Awakening International Ministries. I write a weekly blog and I'm writing the blog right now, a multi, a multi-part blog series on this very subject. It's entitled when Mormon missionaries come knocking. And I do encourage people that when Mormon missionaries do come knocking on your door, which is going to happen, it, like that's a guarantee, it will happen at some point in your life, then I, I, I encourage everybody, don't turn them away, don't turn them away, but invite them in, you know, sit them down on your couch, you know, make them comfortable, offer them a glass of water, and, you know, show them every hospitality and kindness that is becoming to a true follower of the Messiah, because I can assure you that these Mormon missionaries, they're not your enemy. Okay, they really are not your enemy. These are just young boys and young girls that have been indoctrinated into a false religion. They are not the problem. The religion is the problem, and the leadership of the church is the problem. But these young boys and young girls, they just don't know any better. You could be that tool that opens up a, a, a door, the door in their life that leads them into true relationship with God and Christ. But if you slam the door in their face, or you uh, treat them with uh, disdain or uh, mocking or some sort of uh, you know ridiculing type of of attitude, then I can assure you that those Mormon missionaries are just going to go away, and they're going to be thinking, "Hey, whatever faith that person belongs to, I obviously don't want to have anything to do with that." Right? So th there's there's advantages to going on a mission like that, where it forces you to to grow up. It forces you to grow up. It forces you to gain some maturity, something that is severely lacking, you know, in our, our youth today, most certainly. That's true. That's cool. but I go I go to Hong Kong, China, and I'm serving, you know, my my LDS mission. And in the first month I arrived in China, I actually got injured. Um, I would say, not I wouldn't call it severe, severe, but I would say moderately severe type of injury, all of the um, the uh, the tendons in my upper left hamstring, basically those tendons that connect your hamstring to your 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 pelvis, uh, a lot of them got torn, you know, pretty, it, it, it was painful. Oh. It was very painful. And as a Mormon missionary, you're either walking, like everywhere you go, you're either on foot, you're walking, or you're on a bicycle and you're bicycling. And obviously, for those you know tendons in your upper leg, it, you use those quite a bit when you're walking, <laughs> you know, quite a quite a lot. And so what happened was I ended up walking around many miles every single day as a Mormon missionary in Hong Kong, China with this injury in my left upper hamstring. And obviously it's not ever getting better. It's just continually getting, you know, aggravated and re-injured. And it got it got to a point where it was so bad and so painful that I was literally limping around the streets of Hong Kong. I mean, here I was at that point, I was now 20 years old. You know, I left when I was 19. And so going into my, my 20th year, I'm limping as a 20 year old kid, you know, in, in Hong Kong. And it, it it was so bad that the mission president is what he's called. He's he's an older gentleman who, you know, every every mission throughout the world for the LDS Church, there's this leader that they choose, you know, that they appoint. He's the mission president. And the mission president called me in one day and he said, Look, you're obviously in a tremendous amount of pain. You've been hobbling around Hong Kong for the last, you know, 10, 11 months. Uh, we need to send you home. Now, you're supposed to be out here for two years, a total of 24 months, but you know we need to send you back because you're just not getting any better. You're only getting worse. And so in total, I ended up serving 13 months. 24 is what I was supposed to serve, but I only served 13. And I get sent home early on account of this injury. It was, uh, it was basically a medical release. I get back to the United States, and... I expected, as this 20-year-old kid, this naive kid, that I would be shown sympathy, I would be shown there would be understanding as to why I came back early, but what I received from just about everybody, I mean, just about everybody, uh, except my mother, praise God, I love my mother, I... I, I 
she's she's a good woman <laughs> okay she's such i mean the, the kindest you know spirit you know on planet earth i i praise god for the gift of my mother but from most others i experience that that shunning which you know that, that this is where my eyes really began to be opened to the problems of the lds church they began to be open when i saw for myself and experienced for myself this this shunning and this 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 type of hypocrisy where they say that we we love we honor we um we understand you know circumstances individual circumstances things like that but that's not what i experienced i came back early due that due to that medical release to get you know physical therapy and start the healing process for my leg and over the next two possibly two and a half years I had many, many friends and family reject me, turn away from me. Uh, leader, uh, local leaders like bishops of local, you know, uh, they're called wards, basically, you know, local LDS church uh, congregations. Um, and it, it, it actually got so bad and that the, the rumor mill that, you know, that was just churning out all of these horrible, disgusting rumors about me was so bad. I kid you not that within about a year and a half to two years, I became known in, you know, the, the area that I was living at the time, which was Southern Utah, we had moved down to St. George, Utah, I became known as basically this, this black sheep person, you know, I became known as I became known as that guy that came back early from his mission, he was supposed to be out there for 24 months, but he came back early. And some of the stories that just started getting told these blatant and disgusting lies uh, that started getting told. I heard one of these rumors, this was maybe two years after I got back, that one of the rumors that was being spread about me is that I came back early from my mission, or they sent me back because I was, I was basically having sexual relations with Chinese women. And I'm just like, what the <laughs> heck? hell are you guys talking about like seriously like wh what and then and then the the straw that broke the camel's back was about two and a half years after i got back i had a, a girlfriend at the time her name was tasha and we were just going out for a walk one day you know holding hands uh going out for a walk in her neighborhood and this car pulled up next to us and out from the passenger side of the car this this redhead you know, girl steps out. And I, like all human beings, you know, we're all terrible with names, but I'm fairly good with names, but I'm very, very good with faces. You know, I, I, I remember somebody's face. I swear I had never seen this woman before. I was like, I don't know who this person is, right? I have no idea who this redheaded, you know, this girl is. But she steps out of the car and she starts motioning to my girlfriend, you know, to come over and talk with her. And I'm like, hey, do, do you know who this is? And she's like, yeah, uh, we went to school together. You know, hold on a second. So my girlfriend goes over and starts talking with this redhead. And oh, maybe over a two or three minute conversation that I, you know, I, I can't hear what they're saying. But the redhead is kind of giving me these, you know, sideways glances and kind of like pointing in my direction. And I'm like, what, what is going on? What is this? So the redhead gets back in the car. Eventually they drive off and, you know, my girlfriend comes back to me. And I'm like, well, what was that all about? And then I kid you not, what my girlfriend Tasha said to me was, oh, she was just warning me about you. And I'm like, warning you about me for why? Oh, because you came home early from your mission. And I'm like, how, what, how does she even know that? Seriously, like, ser like how, who is this person? And it's just, the, the rumors and the lies, they spread like wildfire. It was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. And I just said at that point, it's like, you know what? Forget this. It's like, if this is how I'm going to be treated by members of the LDS church, then I don't want to have anything to do with you guys. And so I, I stopped attending the LDS church at that point, but I still believed, you know, I, I still, I still believed uh, in the doctrines of the LDS Church, I still believed in Joseph Smith and the books that he had written, like the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants and all these other things. 
I still believe in the leadership of the LDS church. Hey, they're, they're all still prophets, you know, right? That's, you know, that's what I believed. And, but I just, I stopped attending, you know, weekly, right? Because I just, I had enough. I'd had enough with, you know, two and a half years of this, this nonsense. And it is nonsense. It's absolutely despicable. It's despicable behavior. You know, n no one who, no one who calls themselves a Christian should be engaging in this type of stuff. You know, this, the, the, the gossip, the rumors, the lies. It's like, that's, that's not, that's not becoming of a Christian. You know, that's something that's, that's truly hateful to God and to Christ. And I was, I was inactive from the LDS Church for about five years. And during that five years, I, I'm certainly ashamed to say that I was engaging in all the stuff of the world. You know, I'm doing my own thing, my own way. I don't care. It's like I still, quote, believe in God and Christ, but I'm going to go do whatever the hell I want to do. And it's like, well, I think of what James says in James chapter two, it's like, hey, you believe in one God, good for you. The devils also believe that, you know, like it <laughs> doesn't do them any good. So I'm out uh, indulging in the world, seeking my own path, my own way. And it brought a tremendous amount, obviously, of darkness and despair, hopelessness into my life because you walk that path, that's the natural consequence. That's what's going to happen. You think that you can redefine the moral order and there's not going to be any consequence? There's going to be consequences. You know, we're free to choose our choices, but we're not free to choose our consequences for those choices. And so over a five-year period, I'm living in sin. And after about those five years, so now we're getting to right around 2010, so 14 years ago, I I had had enough. I had basically hit rock bottom and I'd had enough. And I knew that whatever it was I was pursuing, it wasn't actually, it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't actually, you know, it wasn't fulfilling to my soul. It, it's kind of like, you know, a life of uh, pursuing hedonistic, you know, temporal uh, pleasures. It's like candy, you know, it's like high fructose corn syrup garbage where it, it's sweet in your mouth. But as soon as you swallow it, it doesn't actually fill you. It doesn't nourish you. It just leaves you feeling sick and empty inside. And that's what I had been doing for the past five years. I had just been eating all this spiritual high fructose corn syrup. And after it, I was like, look, I feel sick spiritually. I you know, am drained and dead inside. I, I, I need God. I, I just knew that. I just knew that I needed God. So... My journey really, really began in 2010 when I went before God with a prayer. And the prayer was, to paraphrase, you know, Father, I just want the truth. Like, whatever that is. I don't know what that even looks like. I just want the truth. And I promise you that if you will show the truth to me, whatever that is, I'm going to do everything I can to walk in it. You know, like, whatever that is, I, I was willing to put it all on the table. And that's the kind of prayer that God hears. Like, <laughs> he hears those prayers. And, like, at this point in my life, I don't, I don't even know the name of God. Like, I wouldn't know the name of God for, like, another four years after this. But that doesn't matter, because God, he looks on the heart, and he sees and he hears those that are in prison, and those that are chained down, uh, those that are that cry out in the the agony of their soul for redemption, for liberation from those those chains of sin and addiction and darkness. And that's where I was. And I needed liberation and I needed the truth. And what happened is that very soon afterwards, now we're getting into basically 2011, I started with who was uh, my girlfriend at the time. Her name uh, is Della, and then we later got married. She and I started going back to the LDS Church together, where we felt that that was... We, we were drawn, drawn back to it, because, you know, God, He's going to draw you on a path that's going to be, imagine, like, um, stepping stones, right? He's not going to give you everything you need right at the beginning, because it's, it's too much. 
it's like it's way too much. You, you know, the, the the human mind couldn't comprehend it all. There's just no way. And so he's like, okay, I need to set you on a path that if you will follow this path one step at a time, it's going to lead you to where you need to be. So we started going back to the LDS church, and I started um, just looking, searching for truth. And I would go, you know, online documentaries, started, uh, you know, watching podcasts, started actually looking at what people were saying. And it was around this time that God began introducing me to individuals that were outside the LDS church box that were providing information to me. And that's yet another false doctrine. And one of these indoctrination practices of the LDS church is that they, they strongly, strongly encourage you, or in fact, they, they outright teach you to never, ever look for information outside of what we tell you to look at. You know, we have we have the LDS Church, we have its prophets leadership, we have uh, these departments called Correlation, where we are, we're putting out manuals and information and source resources, you know, for the membership. So if you have any questions about God or faith or, or church history or anything like that, you go to the sources we provide you. Don't ever look outside, because if you do, well, then you're going to be led astray. That's, again, it's, it's, it's Soviet Union type of, you know, indoctrination, you know, practices. It's just what they do. But I had, I had sworn to God Almighty, I had made this covenant that if he would show me the truth, I was going to follow it. And there were people being introduced into my life through, uh, you know, online sources, that I couldn't deny that what they were sharing with me was resonating with my soul. And these these were individuals like Kent Hovind, uh, Dr. Dino, uh, there was uh, Ken Ham with Answers in Genesis Ministries, there was Ray Comfort with Living Waters Ministries. And these individuals, more than anything else, what they were just teaching was that this book was reliable that this book is the Word of God, and it's trustworthy, it's true. And they were providing me with real-world evidence, you know, demonstrable evidence that, that you could trust it. When the Bible says this is how God did it, you can actually test that, you can go into the real world and see all the evidence to prove that point. You can uh, look at the histories from extra biblical sources and show that this is all accurate. What the Bible says is true is true. And that was such a necessary step because Mormons are raised not trusting the Bible. Mormons are raised to give lip service to the Bible, like we believe the Bible to be the Word of God. But when push comes to shove, Mormons really don't believe the Bible because any time the Bible and its doctrines contradicts the doctrines that are taught by the leadership, they throw the mm. Bible out and they go with the leadership. And so it's like that. there's the evidence that you don't really mm. trust what the Bible says. And this is that's not just one example. I mean, there are dozens of doctrinal examples where you can open up the Bible and say, this is what it teaches very, very plainly. This is what it says, but this is what it says in Mormonism. Which one are you going to go with? And they always go with Mormonism. And so it's like, so you don't really trust the Bible. Yeah, that That's just how it is. But I, I was now getting all of this information, tremendous uh, value and information from all of these sources that were proving to me that no, when the Bible says this, it's actually something you can really trust because look at all the evidence, look at all the, the proof that supports it. And me, a uh, very logical individual, uh, scientific type of mind where if you can, if you can prove something to me, well, I'll, I'll go with it, right? And I, I do value the truth. And especially at this point in my life, I was really desiring the truth. And getting into 2012, this is where I actually began ministerial type work, something that I could have never fathomed I would ever, ever do. Uh, in fact, at this point in my life, I was looking to get, join the Air Force. That's what I was, you know, I was wanting to be a pilot. And it was, I was right there. I, I went into the Air Force, you know, recruiter's office. I was looking over all the paperwork and they handed me the pen and they say, hey, you sign your name on this, we'll get you into the program. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, 
<laughs> it was like there was something there. I wanted it. That's what I wanted to pursue. But it's like there was um, something that came over me in that moment that was just telling me this isn't this isn't for you. That there's something else that you're supposed to do. And so I, I told the recruiter, it's like, hey, thank you. Uh, can I take these? And I'm, I'm just going to think about it. Oh, yeah, you, you think about it. Well, I, I continued to think about it, and it's just it, it never seemed right. It just never actually seemed to you know, resonate that mm. this is a path you should walk. And so now I'm going like, well, what should I do? Getting into 2012, I felt drawn into ministerial type work. And I felt drawn to start working with an organization called the Firm Foundation, which is not directly affiliated with the LDS Church, but their purpose is to defend the LDS Church. Their purpose is to defend Joseph Smith, defend the Book of Mormon, and that that's so it's basically it's basically like a third party group that their sole purpose is to defend Mormonism. Okay. And so I introduced myself to the president of that organization. His name is Rod Meldrum, and I said, "Hey, I just I feel like God wants me to to do this." And he's like, "Okay, well, let's bring you on and see what you can do, and we'll go from there." And it turns out, I ended up working with that organization for the next three years, from 2012 to 2015. So, I literally I I wasn't just any Mormon, but I'm I'm a I'm a seventh generation Mormon. Mormonism is in my blood. I was born and raised in the capital city of all Mormonism, and for a three-year period, I was even a Mormon apologist. <laughs> like, I worked. It was my job to defend Mormonism, for heaven's sakes. Um, Whoa, you, you were the that, Mormon of Mormons, bro. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, seriously, right? It's like what Paul says, you know, Hebrew, Hebrews, Pharisee of Pharisees. Yeah, I was like Mormon of Mormons, like no question about that. Like, in no way whatsoever am I just some, like, average Joe Mormon. That is just not my story, my history. I was—I did things for the defense of Mormonism that we're talking maybe, like, 0.01% of Mormons do. Like, we're talking very, very small numbers here. So—and this is, this is all— Credit to the Almighty. This is the path that he he's guiding me on. And that was so essential. So keep in mind, it's at this same time that I'm being educated by these people outside of the LDS Church that this is a trustworthy book, you know, the Holy Bible. And now I'm with this organization where my job is to defend Mormonism. Well, if you're going to defend something, you have to know what the attacks are. Obviously, it's like you, you you can't defend something if you don't actually know what people outside are saying. So, and this is where that next thing happens, where now I'm actively looking at what a lot of people outside the LDS Church are saying about Mormonism. And there's plenty of things that I came across where, like, people's arguments about Mormonism was like, dude, you are so far off. Like, I can... and, and it's important for it's important for a Mormon who has spent you know in total it was about three decades of my life in that religion. It's important for me to be saying these types of things because whenever you have somebody that's never been a part of the LDS Church, never been a Mormon in all their life, they don't have family that's Mormon, they don't have yet you know, for them to actually you know criticize Mormonism, they never get it right. That, you know, they, they may get general ideas right about the LDS Church and its doctrines, but there are subtle nuances of Mormon doctrine that if somebody doesn't actually get those nuances, then anyone inside the LDS Church, they hear these types of arguments, they're just like, dude, you obviously have no idea what you're talking about. Like, you, you clearly are not—you don't understand Mormonism. And so it, it's kind of like I know general arguments against, say, Catholicism— not Catholics, the people, but the religion, Catholicism. I know general arguments against Catholicism, but I could never, I could never assume that God would, you know, call me or want me to try and reach Catholics, you know, and pull them out of Catholicism because it's like I know that there's so many things about Catholicism that I just don't understand. And, and you're not going to understand those things unless you've lived it, unless you've personally experienced it. 
And so anyway, this that's my story. You know, Mormonism is my experience. And so so many of these attacks that I'm coming across from all of these outside sources, I'm just like, dude, you are off there, wrong there, and I can actually provide a very logical, sound defense. But every so often, there would be somebody that would bring forth an, an argument against Mormonism concerning one of its doctrines. They would open up the Bible, which I was starting to now trust, and they would show me from the Bible, this is what the Bible says very clearly, and not just in one passage, but in multiple passages, and this is what Mormonism says very clearly according to multiple church leaders. You can obviously see they contradict, th these are contradictory. And I would go, you know what, that's actually a really good point. Those are contradictory. Like, you, you can't have, you, you can't have... You know, these contra the uh, there's the law of non-contradiction where it's like you can't have A and B simultaneously be true if they contradict themselves. You, you can't do that. It doesn't work. It's a, it's a fallacy. And so every so often I would come across one of those arguments where it was just a really sound, really good argument, and I had no defense for it. None. And so I was like, that's interesting. So I would just kind of put it on the back burner. That happened once, and then it happened twice, and then three times, and then five times, and then ten times, and then twenty times, where now it's like really, really building up. And it's like, it got to a point where in 2015, after working with the Firm Foundation for three years, I couldn't do it anymore. Because I was brought to a point where I was, I, I was, <laughs> it goes back to the prayer in 2010, I need the truth, and I want the truth. I value the truth, and I was brought to a point where I was like, I don't think this is true. <laughs> like, I don't think what I've been raised to believe is true. And look at look what the Bible is saying across all of these points of doctrine, dozens at that point, and look what Mormonism is saying, and it's like these are blatant contradictions. This episode of The Life Podcast is brought to you by The Way Documentary, The Truth, Reformation 2.0 Apologetics Book, and Truth Tracks. The Way documentary tells the story of our movement. This is the story of people who were trading Easter ham for Passover lamb and Sunday church for Saturday Sabbath, all in an effort to live like their savior. It dives into their stories through their own voices and into the history and theology that show how the church got to where it is today. The Truth, Reformation 2.0 is the only book of its kind, an all-encompassing theological treatise that answers every question a mainstream Christian might have about why you want to keep Torah. And finally, Truth Tracks are small comics beautifully illustrated that use stories and scripture to remind Christians that once we are saved by grace through faith, we are called to live and do the instructions of Yah, His Torah. If you want to learn more about any of these products, go to thewaydoc.com. That's the way, D-O-C, like documentary, dot com. Can you, not to interrupt the flow of the story, but no, no, please. can you, do any of those contradictions pop into your head? I know you mentioned, you know, one where it sounds like infallibility of the, the eldership. Um, <laughs> But if any uh, do pop in your head, we could, I guess that's one right there. <laughs> and baptism for the dead. That, that's definitely one. That's definitely one. It's like, okay. Well, another is, like, this, this is an important one. This is very important. And it's also important for, you know, earlier you talked about, you know, how, how, what's, what's one of the best ways to reach, you know, Mormons, right? Starts with friendship. Don't treat them as your enemy in any way whatsoever. Treat them as your friend. Be kind to them. But... When it comes to actually helping them to see some of the problems in Mormonism, it comes down to how Mormons are taught to test for truth. Everything about Mormonism and how they are to test for truth is always subjective. Always. It's always based on your own personal experiences and your own personal uh, temporary spiritual experiences, okay? And this is taught from... Uh, from the Book of Mormon primarily, and also Joseph Smith. So you get to the final, like, final chapter of the Book of Mormon. Uh, and the Book of Mormon is set up, written by Joseph Smith, inspired by Satan, and I have no, no problem whatsoever, you know, saying that. That's the truth. 
uh, the man was very much so a wolf in sheep's clothing, very much so a false prophet, and he actually engaged in occultic practices to... It, one of those occultic practices is called spirit channeling, and that's basically how the Book of Mormon came into came into being. So it's very much so a false work. It's got some truth in it, but it's laced with the lies of the enemy in order to deceive and destroy souls. You read the Book of Mormon, and you get to the end, and there's this uh, encouragement from one of the sto- one of the books. It's called the Book of Moroni, and and that's what I meant with that. It's it's similar to how the Bible set up. Is the Bible's not one book? It's a compilation of books. It's a library of books, you know, 66 books in total. And the Book of Mormon has these individual books inside, like First Nephi, Second Nephi, the Book of Alma, the Book of Helaman, all of these, you know, names of fictional characters, very much fictional characters. And the final book is called the Book of Moroni. And in chapter 10, it says that after you have read this work, this compilation, you know, the Book of Mormon, then you're encouraged to pray about it. Like, go and pray about it, and how and and what you are the experience you have through praying about it that's going to tell you if this is true and if it's true well then obviously the you know the step in logic from that point is that if the book of mormon is true based on this subjective personal so-called spiritual experience well then joseph smith is also a true prophet and if joseph smith's a true prophet well then the lds church is true that's that's the you know the logic in their minds mm. So what people do is they read the Book of Mormon, and then they pray about it, and they have this spiritual experience where they, they feel the, this fire in their chest, and they just go, oh, God has told me that this is true. And it's like, where is that practice to determine truth? Where is that practice taught in the Bible? Like, show me something in the Bible where like a prophet of God comes among a people and delivers a word from the Almighty to them and then tells them, why don't you go pray about what I've told you? Where is that in the Bible? Like, it, it's not there, ever. But what is in the Bible, a lot, is testing things objectively. Not subjectively, because if, you, if you're relying on yourself and you're relying on your own heart to lead you in the paths of truth, well, I can promise you, you're not going to be led in the paths of truth, because the heart is what? It's deceitful above all things, okay? It's desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. I've had people, no joke, even Mormons, tell me that they know that God is perfectly okay with homosexual behavior. And I'm like, what? God is okay with homosexual behavior? And they're like, yeah. How, how do I know that? Because I prayed about it. I prayed about it, and God told me that he's okay with it because love is love, right? And it's like, no, because God has said that it's an abomination to him, that it's evil, that it's despicable. And those nations that engage in this type of behavior, Leviticus chapter 18, they will be destroyed, that's objective, okay? And we can even test that throughout human history because we see any empire, any kingdom, any nation that has begun to practice these things and they continue to practice them to its natural consequence and conclusion, they always are destroyed. So God says this behavior will destroy you. You then test it in the real world and it does destroy you. It destroys individuals, it destroys families, it destroys communities, states, cities, nations, it destroys it all. It, you spiral out of control into you know wickedness and hedonistic you know practices and perversions until you are destroyed. The cur- the curses of God come over you to wipe you out. It's like that's objective. There's nothing subjective about that. But everything about determining truth in Mormonism is subjective. You pray about these things, and it's like Satan can manipulate that. Satan can manipulate your heart and your feelings and your emotions a lot. There's a reason why those of the world, particularly on the left side of the aisle, politically speaking, they use emotionally charged arguments to make their case because they know human beings are emotional creatures. We're emotional creatures, and if you use emotionally charged words and terms and uh, attacks, 
that resonates with the carnal self that resonates with the fallen man fallen mankind wow mormonism is based on this mormonism is based on subjective testing for truth but you look at the holy bible and it's like it's never taught that way ever in fact the the three tests that are provided in the torah to determine if a prophet is a true prophet from god they're they're objective tests you've got Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, verse 2, and chapter 12, verse 32, which is, do not add to and do not subtract from the commandments of God. Right? Do not add to the words of Moses, don't subtract from the words of Moses. Not that there can't be anything written after Moses, but what it's teaching is that anything that is written after Moses, it has to agree with Moses. It has to. If it doesn't, that's somebody that's not a true prophet. That's an objective test. There's nothing subjective about that. Okay, you go to Deuteronomy chapter 13, that if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams comes among the people, and even if he's able to perform miracles, he can actually perform miracles, but he is teaching you to believe in a different God than Yehovah the Almighty, and to walk in a different path than the path of his commandments, the path of the Torah, you know that's a false prophet. Even if he can perform miracles, doesn't matter irrelevant. That's a that's an objective test. Third objective test is Deuteronomy chapter 18, where if a prophet says that a event will happen, he gives some prophecy, some future event will happen, and it doesn't happen, that's an objective test. And when you put Joseph Smith and any leader of the LDS Church to those three objective tests, they fail every single one of those objective tests, not just once, but many times over. It has nothing to do with praying about it and having this this spiritual, warm, fuzzy feeling that it's like, that's irrelevant. You're, you're, it's like what Ben Shapiro with The Daily Wire says, you know, if, if facts don't care about your feelings. Facts do not care about your feelings. The truth is the truth is the truth, and it always will be. In fact, that's the very meaning of the name of Yehovah, the Almighty, that the meaning of the name Yehovah is he who was, he who is, he who always will be. He, the same, yesterday, today, and forever, the unchangeable one, everlasting to everlasting. His, his word is everlasting. His truth is everlasting. If something is true today, then it was true at any point in time, and it will be true forever, because that's what truth is. It's, it's eternal. That's what's so but, beautiful about the Torah and about realizing that it's right and it's for, I mean, if it was right then, it, it's right now. Exactly. And if it can guide them, <laughs> yeah. it can guide us. Yes, 100%. 100%. And throughout the Bible, this is what we see. We see uh, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John says to the congregation that do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You have this spirit come over you. This is, you know, say you're a Mormon, and you pray about the Book of Mormon, you pray about Joseph Smith or anything about Mormonism, and you have this spirit come over you, <gasps> this warm, fuzzy experience. Well, you're supposed to test that to see if it is actually from God. Because there are many false prophets and many false spirits that have gone out into all the world, okay? Well, how do you test? You think about what the Bereans did. You look at Acts chapter 17. Paul, who is a true apostle, a true sent one from God through Christ, he goes to the Jews in Berea, and he's delivering his message. And they were willing to listen to what he had to say, but they weren't willing to believe him until they had tested his words to the Scriptures, this is what Paul says, you know, about the yeah. Bereans that they were, you know, a, they were a more wonderful people than those at Thessalonica because they were diligently studying the scriptures, which at that time is only the Tanakh, it's only the the old Te as we would call the quote Old Testament, the old the old covenant. And it's like that, that's nonsense. It's just the covenant that's renewed in the blood of Christ. But that's what the Bereans did. They listened to Paul, what he had to say, and then they took his words and they tested them to the words of God as revealed in the, in the Holy Bible. And only when they determined that his words were in harmony with the words of the Holy Bible, then they believed. And it's the exact same thing when you look at um, the first letter 
to the first uh, church in Asia Minor. This is in the book of the Revelation, chapter 2. It's to the believers in Ephesus. Yeshua applauds the believers in Ephesus because he says to them that there have been apostles, quote, apostles that have come among you, and you have tested them, and you have found them to be liars. You tested them. Yeshua applauds them for that. He's like, Yes, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. When someone comes among you with this message from God, this message from Christ, this message of truth, okay, what do you have to say? And does it agree with what God has already said? And if it does align, if it is in harmony with what God has already said, that's something that I can receive. But if it contradicts what God has already said, like you know these these you know these people that have the audacity to you know say that god is okay you know that he's that that homosexuality is like perfectly acceptable to god you're like no he's not no he's not <laughs> he hates it it's an abomination to him how do i know that because he said it is <laughs> and anyone who comes around saying that what God has said is not true, and, or that God has changed, like he's changed his mind, you're not from God. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You're a liar. You're a fraud. So you look at Mormonism, the religion, you look at the leaders of the LDS Church, modern and going all the way back to the beginning, to Joseph Smith, you put any one of these individuals to those three objective tests from the Torah, and they fail. You don't, I don't have to pray about it. In fact, I think that praying about such things is even, I, I think that it's disrespectful to the Almighty. Let me give you an example. Okay. Let's say you have a neighbor and your neighbor buys a brand new TV. Big, nice, beautiful, like massive, massive TV. 86 inch, you know, great, you know, TV. Cost him, you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars. He puts it in his living room, and you can see it th from your house through his living room window. Oh, he's got a brand new TV. Okay, and you just think to yourself, you know what? I need that TV. I want that TV. You covet that TV, right? You want that, and you also justify it in your carnal mind, according to your desperately wicked heart. That hey. I work longer hours and I work harder than my neighbor does, and he doesn't deserve that TV. I deserve that TV. Imagine somebody like that going to God in prayer and praying, God, would you be okay with me breaking into my neighbor's home and stealing his TV and then having me bring it back to my home? And would you be okay with me doing that? And it's like, I, I'm that, that's obviously an extreme example. But I'm using an extreme example to paint the very obvious picture. No, such a prayer would be an abomination to Yehovah. Just, just as it says in the Proverbs, that those who turn away their ear from obeying, from Shema, Shema, listening and obeying the Torah, even their prayer is an abomination. If you went before God with a prayer like that, that would God be okay with you coveting? Would God be okay with you violating your neighbor's property? Would God be okay with you stealing? You know he's not okay with it because he's already said he's not okay with it. He, he's, he says it's wrong. <laughs> that's how you know. That's an objective test. It's like, but that's the same principle. Hmm. When, when I go before God, and so I read the Book of Mormon, and I can test the Book of Mormon objectively to the doctrines taught in the Holy Bible, and I can see that they're not the same that they blatantly contradict on many, many issues, me going before God and praying about if the Book of Mormon is true, it falls in that same line. It's maybe not an, as extreme and as obvious a, of an example, but it's still, it, that's still how I see, how God sees it, is that, you know, you pray about the Book of Mormon or you pray about Joseph Smith, even when Joseph Smith has taught things that are obviously contrary to the Holy Bible in so many ways, that's, that's you going before God saying, God, have you changed? I know you've already said in Malachi that you don't, but maybe you've changed anyway. God, I know that you said this was 
a sin in the past, but maybe you've changed. Maybe it's not a sin anymore. I know that you said that this is the doctrine, but maybe the doctrine's changed. Maybe it's this now. And it's like, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a, quote, God that hears those kinds of prayers, the God of this age, as Paul refers to, you know, the enemy, to Satan. And Satan can come in to this, an individual like that and fill them with whatever feelings and whatever emotions Satan could ever want to give somebody to confirm to them that, hey, you know, this is, this is right, what you're praying about, when all the while you're praying about something that God has already said. You know, you're, you're praying, you're praying basically in that extreme example I gave earlier, you're praying to see if God has changed his mind about his commandments, about his doctrines, about truth. Wow. And so, so you know, it, it, you noticed that you started noticing that stuff while you were studying to defend the religion. I, yeah. And then what, what happened? What did they say? Like, did you just tell this to your <laughs> colleagues? Well, <laughs> Let's yeah. Let's say that bridge got burned pretty severely. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, me and the president of the firm foundation, Rod Meldrum, we had uh, definitely a bit of a falling out. There's no question about that. Uh, that that bridge got torched. <laughs> but it's uh, well, going back, and I just have to you know give all glory to God for this too because he, this is the path, and he's even like it's it's so obvious it's the path because in 2013. So this is while I was still working with the Firm Foundation. I was introduced to Michael Rood and a Rood Awakening International Ministries, right? And then the year after, in 2014, I was introduced through Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, the name, the hallowed name of Yehovah God. And those were like absolute huge milestones, like absolute pivotal stepping stones. Well, that just really, really were showing, were showing me how what the LDS church is doing and practicing and saying when its leadership is doing and saying, it's just, it's not true. It's just not true at all. Um, and, and that, that, that's a whole other, you know, story there, but suffice it to say is over these several year period, I'm continuing my studies and research into Mormonism, the history of the LDS church, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to ask the big questions and receive the big answers. I'm willing to, you know, have the courage to test my own faith and, you know, audit my own beliefs and go, are these actually true or is it just what people have told me is true? And as I'm going through this whole process, I'm gradually being pulled away from the LDS church, from Mormonism, and I'm being drawn closer and closer into relationship with God and Yeshua. This is like what Jesus says in John chapter 6, that no one can come to the Father except the Father draws them. And I was, and that always has to start with a choice on the individual. Like, God's never going to force anything. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't force, well, he forces consequences, that's true. <laughs> like on Judgment Day, if you've been wicked, you, you don't get to choose your, your poison. You don't get to choose your consequence. But he never forces choices. You know, he gives us agency to choose. And for the individual that chooses to value truth, God's going to be like, okay, here's, here's one that I, through my word and my spirit, I'm going to draw this individual out from whatever lies and whatever worthlessness and unprofitable things they've been raised to believe, and I'm going to draw them towards the truth, towards the light. And so in 2015... That bridge with the firm foundation got burned. I left being a Mormon apologist, stopped uh, the year previous, actually, in 2014. I had stopped attending the LDS Church again. So it's, it's funny because the first time I stopped attending the LDS Church, I did it because, because I was like deeply offended by the membership you know, and their hypocrisy and their shunning towards me for completely irrelevant, like total, just based on lies entirely. You know, I, That's why I left or stopped attending the first time. Second time I stopped attending is because I just— I, I also recognized that I wasn't being fed in the LDS church, right? I would go to church every Sunday, and I began seeing so clearly that there was like this deadness 
in the eyes of a lot of the members, not all of the members, but a lot of them. They kind of had this deer in the headlights sort of look where there was no passion, there was no fire, there was no energy, no life. It was just this spiritually arid desert, you know, that I would attend. And then I would even hear things on Sunday from whatever, you know, individual or teacher was, you know, giving a lesson. And they would say things that were, that I knew were false, <laughs> that I knew were false. And I'm just like, and then I would, I became known as that guy in, the, in my congregation. I would raise my hand whenever something was taught that was not true. And you would hear like this, you would hear like this sigh throughout the congregation. Like people would be like, Ugh. not Jake again. Like, <laughs> Here's Jake again. He's got something else to say. Oh my gosh. It's like, can't this, can't this guy just shut his mouth? <laughs> That's great though. That's a good witness to but, all of them. I mean, it, it, you know, you, yeah, you just, you gotta, you gotta speak up. You just, you gotta speak up, but you know, you do it, you know, with, with kindness. It's not like I would, you know, uh, you know, I, I raise my hand respectfully. It's not, I don't just like, you know, speak out over the teacher or anything like that. But when the teacher says something that's not true, then I'm more than willing to, you know, raise my hand and just say, actually, this, this is what the Bible says. <laughs> um, so, oh, I, 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 and, and it, I wanted to make sure you got to where you found a rude awakening. Like what, how, what, how did that happen? Did, it, Oh, in okay. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Well, that that's that in of itself uh, is is quite the story because <laughs> it was in 2013 that I was introduced to a rude awakening, and how it happened was actually through the Firm Foundation. Like, if I had not been working with the Firm Foundation, I don't think it. Well, God would have found some other way, of course. But this is this is how it happened. I was over at um, Rod Meldrum's, the president's uh, house, one evening, and I was uh, in his office, and we were discussing like the upcoming Book of Mormon conference that we were planning for, or something like that. And I looked over at his desk, and over on his desk was this DVD set, you know, not not like a little thin one. It was like more one of the the fat DVD sets, so you know that there was like at least five or six you know discs in there. And it caught my eye. I, I went over and I, I picked it up and I looked at it. And there was this funny looking individual on the front. He had this big old like Santa Claus like beard. And he was wearing like these priestly looking bluish robes. And, and on the top it said a rude awakening, you know, R-O-O-D. You know, just right, right here, <laughs> you know, a rude awakening. And it was entitled Prophecies in the Spring Feasts of the Lord. And... I look on the back and I read it and, you know, he's talking about Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits and the Feast of Weeks. And I had heard of Passover before, but I, I could basically give you a short, brief type of explanation about what Passover is. But I had never heard of unleavened bread or first fruits or the Feast of Weeks. I hadn't heard of any of these things. And so I'm, it caught my attention and I talked to Rod and I say, hey, Rod, you know, what, uh, what's this all about? And he's like, oh, a, a friend of mine gave that to me a while ago, and I started watching it, but I, I just wasn't interested. And I'm like, okay, well, do you mind if I borrowed it and checked it out for myself? Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. But, and he gave me this warning, he's like, but just make sure that you take it with a big grain of salt, Jake, because you got to understand, that's not from the LDS church. He told me that, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. But at this point, you know, I had already been introduced to these other ministers from these other ministries, and so I was like, yeah, I'll, 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 be, I'll be careful with it, right? I'll, I'll be careful with it. So I, I take the DVD set home, put in disc one, and I ended up binge-watching, like, the whole thing over, like, the next two days. Like, you know, this, this big old teaching series that was about Yeshua proving that gets back to that objective testing i was talking about showing proving that yeshua is the messiah because here he is fulfilling the spring feasts of god to the very day and the very hour that the israelites have been practicing and rehearsing these things for the previous 1500 years since the time of moses you know he's like the only day of the year that he could have been sacrificed as the passover lamb was on the preparation day to the passover it's the only day that it could have happened. And that he he takes away the the leaven, the sin of the house, you know, 
as he is, you know, put in the heart of the earth. He's, you know, takes away the sin of the house and he's resurrected, not Easter Sunday morning, but he's resurrected right there at the, the very end of Shabbat as the sun goes down, thus beginning the very beginning of the day of first fruits that week. And he and those with him are that first fruits offering the resurrection. And then 40, 40 days later, he's with his disciples for those 40 days, ascends into heaven. And the 10 days after that, it was on the day of Pentecost. It was on the Feast of Weeks that the spirit of Yehovah is poured out on the disciples at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And I, I'm seeing all these things. And you know, Michael Rood is proving these from the Bible and from uh, historical sources as well. And I'm just, I'm eating this up. Like, I am just so famished for this kind of stuff, for just the truth. So famished for it. And so I eat the whole thing up. And after I was finished with it, I was like, I, I need more. Like, I need more. Is there any more? So I hop online, I go to YouTube, and I look up A Root Awakening, find A Root Awakening on YouTube. And I go through their playlists, and I find out, whoa, he's got a whole other prophecies in the fall feasts of the Lord series. What's this all about? And I had never heard of trumpets, you know, day of trumpets, day of atonement, the festival of tabernacles. I had no idea about this kind of stuff. So I've watched that and I see that these are prophetic, that these feasts in the fall are all prophetic shadow pictures pointing to the second coming of Yeshua when he will fulfill these when he returns. So over the next like three months, I ended up like watching everything that was on a rude awakening on YouTube, like every video they had, everything. And then beyond that, I was even looking at other Torah based ministries. Like I, I, before this, I hadn't even heard of the, the word Torah. Like, I don't even know what Torah is. No idea. You know, <laughs> I had no idea. somebody, you know, if somebody in 2012 or 11 or 10 had said, you know, the Torah, I'd be clueless. But you know, you understand. It's like, oh, it's the five books of Moses, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, so beyond a rude awakening, I'm also looking at, say, 119 Ministries. I, I looked at uh, Jim Staley's ministry at the time, which was called Passion for Truth Ministries, and I'm also now learning about, like, the paganism of Christmas and Easter, uh, Halloween, Valentine's Day, these pagan holidays that Christians engage in, you know, and celebrate, and two of them they attribute entirely to Jesus. You know, his birth with Christmas and his resurrection with Easter. And it's like, these have nothing to do with Jesus, nothing whatsoever, <laughs> and nothing. And so <laughs> uh, that that's how I was really introduced to the Torah. It was actually through a rude away. Uh, it was through me working with the Firm Foundation <laughs> and seeing that DVD set that was just right there on Rod Meldrum's desk. And that was one, I tell you, that was one of the biggest steps. Um and one, and certainly one of the biggest was the next year, 2014, when I was introduced to the the, the hallowed name of the Almighty through Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson through uh, a teaching series they did years ago called the Open Doors series, which phenomenal series, like amazing, 16 videos, uh, eight teachings each, uh, roughly about an hour each, maybe an hour and 15 minutes each, and that Open Door series. I would say opened the biggest door in my life to really come to understand who my father is, who my, my creator is, who the king of the universe mm. is. And, um, wow. yeah, by the time 2015 rolled around, I knew I, I couldn't keep defending Mormonism. I just couldn't. Uh, it was the year after in 2016, November of 2016, that I started my own ministry called the Sword of Yehovah Ministries. And one of the focuses of the Sword of Yehovah Ministries, well, the, 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 the primary focus for the Sword of Yehovah is to exalt the same two things that God exalts above all things. He says in the Psalms, um, forgive me, I forgot the, there's 150 of them, so I <laughs> forgot the number of the Psalm. But uh, in the Psalms, Yehovah says that he exalts two things above all things, and that's his name and his word. And his word comes in those two forms. There's the written recorded form, the Holy Bible, and then the living form, his beloved son, Yeshua. He exalts those two things above all things. And that's the inspiration behind the sword of Yehovah, is the sword, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, 17, is that we need to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then, of course, it's his name, his hallowed, uh, glorious name. And so I began 
my own ministry, November of 16, exalting God's name, exalting his word, teaching from the Holy Bible. I still, unfortunately, at that time, I still, even though I had left the LDS church, um, even in early 17, I was basically excommunicated from the LDS church <laughs> um, because they were they were watching me. It's kind of a funny story. They were watching me, the leadership. They had to have been because I upload my very first teaching for my own ministry, uh, November of 2016, and literally three hours after uploading that very first teaching, I get a, a text message to my phone saying that the local bishop, the local LDS bishop, wanted to you know meet with me, and I hadn't. And I had moved to a different area. I had moved to a different area. I had never contacted the local bishopric or the LDS church in that area. It, like, I had moved even out of the state. I had lived in southern Utah, and now I was living in northern Idaho. And I'm like, how do they even have my number? You know, and they, they contact me three hours after my very first video saying they he wants to meet with me. And I'm like, okay. So this I set up an appointment. Bishop, sorry, this is the local bishop in Idaho? Or, yeah. Whoa. It was the local bishop in Idaho. So what had happened is that it, it would have had to have been individuals working with the LDS Church at some level, uh, even at a high level, in Salt Lake City, that were just keeping an eye on me. You know, because they they knew that I was a Mormon apologist for those three years with the Firm Foundation, and they knew that I had left the Firm Foundation for, uh, yes, biblical mm. reasons. And then I had stopped attending the LDS church, even though I was still officially a, quote, member. I was still on the books as a, as a member of the church. They, they, they had to have been keeping an eye on me. That's the only explanation. I upload my very first video, and three hours later, I get a, a, a text message. What would have happened is the leadership, someone at the leadership level, would have had to have contacted the local bishop who knew I was in that area, that I had moved to that area, then contacts me how they got my number, you know, only God knows. That's and crazy. we set up an appointment. Yeah, I, I set up an appointment with this uh, local bishop where I was given an ultimatum. And the ultimatum was that I either stop what I'm doing with this new ministry that I had started, and that I also recant everything that I've ever said against the LDS Church, against his leadership, against his doctrines, like... That's that's what you have to do. Um, or you can send in a letter to the LDS Church. Oh, uh, Let's see. The ultimate was that if, if I recanted, stopped the ministry and recanted everything that I'd ever said against the LDS Church, then I could still remain a member of the LDS Church. So that was option A. Option B was that I could send a letter in just saying I leave the LDS Church officially, take my names off the record. Or C, they would hold a disciplinary council and it would be determined that I would be excommunicated. And it's like, th that, was it. that was it. It was just like, you, you're you basically, you either stop what you're doing, or you're going to leave the LDS Church, either voluntarily, or we're going to boot you out. And I'm just like, well, if that's my option, then whatever. I'll just send in a letter and just get out of here. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to have, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine with leaving. That's, that's, that's cool. So um, that's what happened. But I, I started the ministry. And it, so even though I was booted out of the LDS church, basically the beginning of 2017, I still, unfortunately at that time, still believed that uh, Joseph Smith was a true prophet because my, my mindset was, hey, Mormonism started on the right foot with a true prophet, but then it got off track with the next one, Brigham Young, and certainly the next one after that, John Taylor, and, you know, it... That that had been my mindset, and it's actually it happens to a lot of people as they're you know they leave Mormonism. They have this idea that it's like, well, it it, it was a good thing from the beginning, but then they went off the rails with the next generation, and it's just been going off the rails ever since. And it's like, no, it's been bad from the very beginning. The roots are bad. The foundation is bad. You, you gotta you gotta break it all down. When did you realize and that? And, and that, I tell you, that actually was the most difficult year of my life. And I, I have, I've gone through plenty of things, but the, the challenges and the trials that I experienced uh, in the year 2017 to this, basically the end of uh, the summer of 2018, 
that was an extremely challenging year, the the hardest year of my life, because there was this this every day was like there was this war going on in my brain. Uh, I was living in I was living with cognitive dissonance every day, where I was being shown so much truth from God about the Holy Bible, and I had already clearly determined that Mormonism or the LDS Church from Joseph Smith or from Brigham Young onward had gone off the rails, but I had not at that point, I had not yet had the the courage, really, I had not yet had the courage to look at Joseph Smith himself because, because I had been raised from the cradle to love Joseph Smith, to respect Joseph Smith, to honor Joseph Smith. You know, that Mormons are taught that Joseph Smith is literally the greatest prophet that has ever lived. Like, one of the doctrines of Mormonism, this is in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, it's section 135, it is recorded that no one has done more for the salvation for the souls of mankind than Joseph Smith, except Jesus Christ only. So it's ba like in the mind of a Mormon, what you were taught from the cradle is that there's Jesus and then there's Joseph Smith. And then it like then, you know, Moses and all of them, you know, below that. That's the that's the level that that is that is doctrine. That is what Mormons are taught. And so for you to question Joseph Smith, it's it's a whole it's a whole other level of of courage. It, it it takes it takes a lot to question Joseph Smith for a Mormon. Because he's he's not just some other guy in the mind of a Mormon. He's like the guy, second only to Jesus himself. And so in 2017, I just things started spiraling out of control. I was even though I was doing the ministry and I felt nourished and satisfied by doing the work of God with the ministry, there was still a part of me that was just hurting. Every day, I was in pain mentally and emotionally and spiritually every single day because of this cognitive dissonance where there's this, this war raging in my mind and heart and soul. And it eventually got so bad that I, I made the decision, I need to look at Joseph Smith himself. I need to look at the man himself, and I need to test him and test the things he directly said and he directly taught. And I also need to test the book that he, you know, that at that time, I still believe that God had, um, you know, caused these ancient peoples to write, and then Joseph Smith restored. It's basically the, the story of the Book of Mormon. Uh, the basic story of the Book of Mormon is that it was written by ancient American prophets, and then Joseph Smith found it on these gold golden plates, and then he translated it to, into what's called the Book of Mormon. Seems so ridiculous now, but okay, that's the story. <laughs> um, I finally gained the courage to just test Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon directly. And for that year, 2017 and 2018, that's when I was I just felt like I was being torn apart. Because the man that I had been raised to trust and to love, and the man that I had even worked to defend, it was my job to defend this man, I began seeing that he himself was failing on, you know, these with these objective tests. And it was very, very hard for me to let that go. I mean, for a, for a long time, I was, I was clinging to Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon by my fingernails and just trying to come up with any sort of scenario and performing all of these spiritual and scriptural gymnastics and contortionist acts to try and make a, try and force a square peg into a round hole, just trying to make it work. Like I am desperate to still have this person still be a true prophet of God. I am desperate to still have the Book of Mormon be a true book. And to somebody that has never been raised in Mormonism, that might seem like maybe something odd, right? It's like, why why can't you just, you already see there's problems throughout all of Mormonism. You already left the LDS church. You, you left voluntarily. Why can't you just go one step further? And it's like, it, it's 
when you when you have these doctrines ingrained into your very soul from you know when you're an infant it, it is there's a part of you that dies when you are being shown these things there's there's a there's a part of your soul that is that just gets crushed and that's what was happening to me i was just you know it was like it was like garden of gethsemane sort of you know millstones going over those uh, the the olives to press you know just to press that oil right out of the olives you know like our lord yeshua that you know the the weight of our sin being placed upon yeshua by the almighty father in the garden that that weight that burden it was like the 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 blood was being pressed out of the very pores of his body and that's kind of how i felt on that mental and emotional and spiritual level it's just i just felt crushed like every torture. day my god because there was there was there was a part of me that was dying every day and eventually eventually uh summer or late summer of 2018 after about a year of this torment torment of the soul god had shown me enough enough that i eventually I eventually realized. I, I I eventually came to that realization that had been obvious the whole time, in hindsight, right? But I eventually did come to that realization. Hey, Mormonism was rotten from the beginning. It was bad from the roots. And as Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 15, every plant that my father has not planted needs to be pulled up by the roots. And so entirely by the grace of Yehovah through the gift of his son Yeshua end of summer 2018 the Joseph Smith Mormonism Book of Mormon anything that's Mormon related it was pulled out of my life by the roots and tossed away and immediately after that after that realization had come that cognitive dissonance ended the war ended in my in my mind in my heart and i felt peace genuine peace something that i had not felt in a long time because eventually i i basically i'd been i'd been clinging to this dead carcass right and it came to a point where i i let that dead carcass go and that weight was gone the burden was gone the war was over Vic, you know truth had had the victory and, Praise Yah! I'm so happy. And and every and everything that I have seen and experienced and learned, because you know my my research and my knowledge concerning the Bible and uh, anything Mormon related, Mormonism related, since 2018 has only increased. I literally have never once come across anything after summer of 2018 that has caused me to doubt that realization never i have only ever come across many many dozens of examples that that further bolster that realization that joseph smith is that horrendous wolf in sheep's clothing a ravenous wolf mormonism from the roots it was rotten it was it was it was a false religion from the beginning what was it about it during that seven, 2017 beginning of 2018 period do you remember if there was ever one thing that was like oh joseph smith it's like beyond redemption at this point yes there there actually was yeah it's it's what i it's what i call the the straw that broke the camel's back um end of summer 2018 because God knew that I was clinging to the Book of Mormon by my fingernails, and I was just like, there was a part of me that wasn't willing to let the Book of Mormon go, God needed to show me something that was only Joseph Smith, had nothing to do with the Book of Mormon, nothing whatsoever. It was only the man himself. And it had to do with what is uh, a, a pillar of Mormonism. I mean, this isn't just like a minor doctrine in Mormonism. This is an absolute foundational pillar of Mormonism. And it has to do with uh, what they call the restoration of the priesthood. 
very, very quickly in Mormonism, it's taught that there are two different priesthoods. One of them is a lower priesthood, and one of them is a higher priesthood. And the lower priesthood is the Aaronic, and then the higher is the Melchizedek, or Melchizedek. And what's taught in Mormonism is that these priesthoods were lost at the end of the first century with the death of the apostles of, of Jesus. That these apostles of Jesus, they had the priesthood, this, this authority to act in the name of God, but it was lost from the world and it needed to be restored. And so, as the stories go, Joseph Smith and one of his, <laughs> one of his accomplices, his name is uh, Oliver Cowdery, they went out into uh, a grove of trees uh, near uh, uh, the Susquehanna River. This is in western New York. And they wanted the priesthood. They wanted this authority, right? So they prayed. It's a whole objective thing, a uh, subjective thing about Mormonism. So they prayed. And as the story goes, a resurrected being appeared to them. This was John the Baptist, resurrected. So he got his head. <laughs> uh, so this is the story. John the Baptist, as a resurrected, glorified being, appears to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and gives them the Aaronic priesthood. And when you know John the Baptist, well, you do know that John is a literal blood descendant of Aaron. You have the Torah, which teaches that priests, they can only be the male descendants of Aaron of that Aaronic line. So you got Aaron, who was the high priest originally, and then you got um, Eleazar, and you got his male descendants. They go all the way down. And yeah, you do eventually get to John the Baptist, who his father, Zechariah, he's a Cohen, he's a priest of the Aaronic order. So John the Baptist is also a priest of the Aaronic order. But here's the thing. You can't just give someone the Aaronic priesthood. You can't. That's literally impossible. You're either a male descendant of Aaron, and if you are, then it is your right. Doesn't mean that you have to be a priest, but it is your right by the authority of God to act as a priest. You have that right. In fact, when you turn to Numbers chapter 16, this is the account of, of um, uh, Dathan and uh, uh, Korah, right? The rebellion of Korah and the 250 you know, Levites. These were Levites, so they're of the same tribe of Israel as Moses and Aaron uh, and, you know, and even Moses, you know, Moses was the prophet of God, the servant of Jehovah, but he wasn't made as high priest. You know, he was a brother, you know, to Aaron. You know, Aaron was his older brother, but it's like, but you have all of these Levites, like Korah and Dathan and Abiram, and then you the 250 Levites, and they're demanding to be priests. They, they, they can do ministerial type, you know, work at the temple or the tabernacle, but they can't actually act as a priest. And God is so clear on this that they ended up getting destroyed for wanting to be priests. So you have this rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and it was all over the subject. We want to be priests just like you, Aaron, and your male sons. And God says, no, that's not allowed, even for members of the same tribe, the tribe of Levi. The earth opens up between, you know, beneath them. They all fall in, and then the 250 uh, Levites, fire from Yehovah comes out from the tabernacle and consumes them all. That's how serious God is about this subject. And then you fast forward to the time of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and they just go out and they pray, and then supposedly John the Baptist, resurrected and glorified, appears to them, and then just gives them this authority? It's like, whoa. That was one of the big things. But okay. It goes further than that. So, as the story continues, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery later go out and they pray again, and three other beings, resurrected, glorified beings, appear to them. This is Peter, James, and John. And then Peter, James, and John give Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery this higher priesthood of the, the Melchizedek priesthood. <laughs> and this is a pillar of Mormonism. 
that the priesthood was lost from the world and it needed to be restored. Huge problems, obviously, with the Aaronic issue. It's like, if you're not a male descendant of Aaron, you can't be an or. Uh, you can't be a priest of the Aaronic order. Not even our Lord Yeshua. This is confirmed in the epistle to the Hebrews. Yeshua couldn't be a priest of the Aaronic order. Yeah. He's not a descendant of Aaron. So you want to tell me that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and any male member of the LDS Church can be made as an Aaronic priest? As as they put hand, you know members of the LDS Church, like my dad and grandpa, they put their hands on my head when I turned 16, and they confirmed me as a a priest of the Aaronic order. It's like, you can't do that. You don't have the authority to do that. But further than that, with the Melchizedek priesthood, in Mormonism, they teach that there's these two priesthoods, one's lower and one's higher. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there's just two ways to be a priest. There's basically like two paths that converge to the same destination. The same destination being acting as a priest of God. There's either the letter of the word path, the Aaronic path, where if you are a male descendant of Aaron, then it is your right to act as a priest. And then there's the spirit and truth word path, where you have Yeshua, who is the high priest of the Melchizedek order, the order of the king of righteousness, and he has the authority from God to any male that Yeshua chooses— Yeshua has the authority from God to make them as a priest, to act in the name of God. There's not some lesser or higher priesthood. There's just two roads that converge to the same destination. So, so I'm realizing this, and it's like there's not a lesser and higher priesthood, and you can't just give someone the Aaronic priesthood. You're either born with that right or you don't have it, period. And then, further than this, Yeshua is the one that has the authority to make anyone a priest of the Melchizedek order, because he is the high priest of the Melchizedek order forever. And yes, it's true that Yeshua did die, but he was only dead for three days and three nights. Yeshua is still alive today. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Yes. Praise so what the LDS Church teaches is that the priesthood, Aaronic and Melchizedek, was lost from the world with the death of the apostles in the first century. It needed to be restored. Problem, the one that has, first of all, those of the Aaronic line from Aaron, they're still on the earth. They still have the right to act as priests of God. If, if you can show through your genealogical line that you go back to Aaron, the brother of Moses, okay, and you're a male, you have the right to act as a priest of the Aaronic order. Second, for the Melchizedek order, Yeshua is the only one that has the authority to make you as a priest of that order, and he's still alive. Therefore, nothing was lost from the world. Therefore, nothing needed to be restored. That was the revelation. That is a pillar of Mormonism. And, and it has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. That is solely Joseph Smith. And when, I met, when that realization came to me from God at the end of summer 2018, I threw my hands up and I said, this man is a fraud. I knew he was a fraud. And he went out of my life. Book of Mormon went out of my life. Mormonism went out of my life just like that. Because and it's ultimately because of the Torah, because of the truth. I... I looked at the life of Joseph Smith and this pillar of Mormonism with this restoration of the priesthood stuff. I looked at the Torah. I looked at the Bible. And I said, objectively, I know that this is a lie. I don't have to pray about it. I don't have to have some subjective spiritual experience. I know it's a lie because God has said, this is the truth. Anything that contradicts this is going to be a lie. And anyone that does contradict this is a liar. Wow. So that was the that was the thing that was earth shattering to me. Absolutely earth shattering. I'm so glad that you walked walked us through that part of it because any Mormon who's watching this may still believe that and and they oh, can see and I, you walk through it. And I I hope that I really do because if there is 
any Mormon out there that's watching this, then to you directly, I'm saying, I, I love you. I love you as my brother. I love you as my sister. I love you as <clears throat> I do genuinely consider you to be my people. And I do know you and I do understand you. I understand what you believe and I understand why you believe it. I know why you believe it. And, and I can just promise you that the truth is eternal. God, Yehovah, Jehovah, the everlasting father, he's real. He's alive from everlasting to everlasting. He is alive. His son, Yeshua, is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. God sent his son, Yeshua, to save your soul, just as he has saved mine. And I know it's challenging. I know it's challenging to open your eyes to to recognize that you've been taught lies. But if you will have the courage to, to see that, to recognize that, then I can promise you, even if, even if there's going to be trials and tribulations that, that come with that journey, coming out from Mormonism into the truth, which there will be, I can assure you of that, the journey is worth it. The destination is glorious and beautiful. And um, so, yes, I just... Um, I really do hope that there are Mormons watching because I do hope uh, it, it, it continues to be a, a huge part of my heart to reach Mormons. Um, it's something that I genuinely believe God has called me to do just because it, it's exceptionally rare, exceptionally rare for someone to leave Mormonism and and go into a Bible or even further than that, a Torah based faith incredibly rare in fact <laughs> i mean it, it it you can practically say it hardly ever happens now praise be to god since i started my ministry in november of 16 god through the work that i've done has been very successful at reaching hundreds of mormons and bringing them out from mormonism and i praise god for that but i'm just i'm hoping that god will continue to use me to reach many thousands more, tens of thousands more, hundreds of thousands more. I, I hope for that with all my heart. Yeah. Because it 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 requires it requires someone who was once a Mormon to reach Mormons. Yeah. Or at the very least to educate others into these subtle nuances of what Mormonism is about and its doctrines, so that they can then in turn reach Mormons. Like if for instance, if some Mormon missionaries come knocking on your door, then please invite them in. Show them love. Show them kindness. Don't treat them as your enemy because they're not. They're just young boys and girls that <clears throat> that have been deceived. They're just I mean, would you would you treat you know someone that's trying to flee out from the prison of North Korea? Would you treat that person as your enemy? No, they're they're trying to get out from lies. They just don't know any better. You know, they just don't know. They they there there are so many people in Mormonism that they want the truth. They just don't even know where to begin to look for it. They just don't they they don't have uh, the tools, or at least they think they don't have the tools available to them that can help them on that journey. You see, and and my own journey, I didn't have somebody like that in my life. I it was it was it was God and his son Yeshua, and it was the word of truth, it was the Holy Bible, and it was these individuals just online that I was, you know, looking at and studying. But but actually having someone in my life that I could sit down with and ask questions and get answers and have real guidance to come out from Mormonism, I had none of that. I had to fight tooth and claw to find the truth to dig down deep and and find the and find the treasure that <laughs> the treasure that was always there <laughs> it was always in front of me i just had to really dig down deep in order to realize the treasure that was always there wow um so yes, if there if there are any Mormons watching, then I and I certainly hope there are, then just know that um that I'm here for you. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. And uh you can you can go to um 
you can go to a rude awakening um on youtube uh we do weekly teachings live stream teachings even in the holy bible and you can even go to uh my ministry uh my personal ministry which is uh found at youtube.com forward slash yhvh sword and there's literally years of material <laughs> that you know i've put out there so um but yeah that that's that's my journey that's my testimony and it, it led uh to this amazing uh, this amazing destination where i'm now at where earlier this year passover of this year 2024 i was approached by the ceo of a rude awakening international ministries and they were looking for uh, a teacher they were looking for someone that we brought on as basically the primary teacher for a rude awakening moving forward and all praise be to god they chose me i mean the the very ministry that 11 years earlier in 2013 had introduced me to the torah and introduced me to the feasts and festivals of god and a year later with nehemia gordon and keith johnson introducing me to the name of yehovah um god god led me on a path that ultimately has made me as as a teacher of that very ministry and so it's it's been a wild ride <laughs> but uh it's also been incredibly glorious to see the hand of Yehovah. incredibly glorious that's beautiful man i love hearing it and well i have more questions for you like i'm oh yeah no please, please. i see how I, you i'm i'm loving you this. exited logically you exited you know spiritually from this and but what all right what was the fallout in your personal life if you want to talk about that we don't have to it may be you know painful i don't know but yeah there i certainly won't go into details okay. uh on that but um uh, even even loss of uh family um Genuinely, I mean, that year, overcoming that battle in my heart and soul, uh, 2017 to the end of the summer of 2018, I do say that that year was easily the most difficult, challenging year of my entire life. But in the years since, there's been uh, incredible hardships on an emotional uh, level concerning family and even even my own children, whom I who are my greatest treasures on on earth, um, that I I um, yeah again I I won't go into you know specifics on that, but it, it's even though the war ended in end of summer twenty eighteen, there was intense uh, hardships and emotional trials that came afterwards that. I do praise God have been getting much better Okay. that for anyone that will put their trust in God. Well, this is like what I said earlier when I was uh, addressing, hopefully those Mormons that are watching. And I was saying that coming out from Mormonism, you can, you can be assured that there are going to be trials. There will be trials. There's that's unavoidable. But if you, will continue to trust in Yehovah and in his son Yeshua and in the written word of God, the Holy Bible, through all of that, through those even Job-like trials, then I can promise you this, God will get you through that. He will get you through those trials. And the, the light at the end of that dark tunnel is glorious and it's beautiful doesn't mean that the pain won't be there but the um i can just say that gaining that that relationship true and everlasting relationship with god and christ it is genuinely the most valuable thing in all of our existence i mean it's it is literally eternal life, as Yeshua says in John seventeen three, that this is eternal life, that they know you, Yehovah, the only true God, and Jesus Christ that you have sent. And for that relationship to have that, 
it, it's worth all it, it's worth going through hell to get to heaven that's well so. put as well but we, we don't have to talk about that more but man you give up you give up a lot uh and it thank goodness the word tells us that any trials and tribulations you go through for his name's sake are counted unto you as righteousness if i'm quoting that right or something like that but <laughs> yes yeah absolutely and and our and our, our our faith is tested um abraham you think of you know abraham and you think of uh james chapter 2 where the the faith chapter faith without works is meaningless it's dead you know abraham was proven to be righteous in the sight of god through his actions that that Faith is not faith if it is not lived, and Abraham was willing to live his faith, willing to live his trust in the Almighty, and as a result, he was found to be righteous in the sight of God, and he was even called the friend of God, and that's something I desire. Like, I desire to be called the friend of God and the friend of of his son, Yeshua, the Christ. I desire to, to have that that relationship that will last forever, literally forever, that for those who endure faithfully to the end, you will be saved, as Yeshua says in Matthew 24, verse 13. And the, the glory that we have to look forward to is, is truly beyond human comprehension. I think of um, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, passages is in the book of Daniel, and it's Daniel chapter 12. It says, uh, starting in verse 2, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness They'll shine like the stars forever and ever. That's cool. It's like what Yeshua says in the Gospels that for the righteous in the kingdom of Yehovah the Father, they will shine like the sun. And John later alludes to that, speaking of that same thing in his first epistle, 1 John, where he says that when Yeshua appears... And his glorious return on that future day of trumpets, we don't know the year, but on that great day of trumpets, when that seventh trumpet sounds and Yeshua returns, John says that we will see him as he is, for we will be like him. We will be, you know, made perfect as he is perfect, glorious as he is glorious. That we'll get to trade in this this clunky you know, broken down Volkswagen, you know, this lemon of a vehicle, and we'll get to trade in for uh, an eternal uh, Maserati, Bugatti yeah. or Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> something that uh, moth and rust does not corrupt and uh, something that is truly everlasting. And just as it says, I just, I love this. Once again, Daniel 12, verse 3, those who are wise, and I tell you that if you're, if you're wise, well, then you're then you're going to fear Yehovah God. You're going to honor and revere him. Um, as the Bible says, that the fear of Yehovah is the beginning of wisdom. And so it, it takes me back to that prayer that I, I spoke in um, 2010, where I just wanted the truth. I didn't even know what that was. I had no idea. It's like I, I just knew that I was in a place where hitting rock bottom, I, I need God. I need the truth. I need some light. I need guidance. But if you desire that with all of your heart and you and you covenant with God that you will follow it, come, you know, come what come what may, whatever hell you have to go through and endure, you will follow it, then you are in fact wise. That is that is wisdom to do such things. And God says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. And I really look forward to that. Wow, man. <laughs> that that right there, that that's that's worth everything. That's that's worth, you know, anything we 
would have to go through in this life. So you got you got rudely awakened and it totally changed your life. And now you're rudely awakening others. <laughs> no, I, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's no, it's true. It's like now I do say this is that I'm I'm definitely not Michael Rude. Um his personality and my I mean I I love the man. I will always always love the man and honor the man. Um but I'm I'm just not him, you know. I'm I'm not I don't have his personality. Um, but with the tools and the talents and abilities that God has given me, I am committed to using that for the glory of God and to God willing to help lead many to righteousness. It's going to be exciting um, to see how things go over there for the, I mean, I mean, I'm excited to see, you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm excited. That's for certain. I mean, we, um, uh, we got many teachings uh you know i i just uh returned from charlotte north carolina just a few weeks ago having filmed this big long fall teaching series called return of the king that's right now uh premiering uh for shabbat night live friday evenings we do a wednesday live stream right here you know from my home studio in utah uh called the sword of yehovah because that's that was one of my conditions with a rude awakening i said okay I'm not getting rid of the name. Like I, I, the sword of Yehovah is the name that God gave me, and it's also a name that gives honor and praise to my father. And it's like I, that name can never go away. That name has to stay. And they're like, yeah, that's that's great. Uh, we'll we'll have that be the name of your Wednesday evening live stream series. I'm like, sounds good to me. That sounds great. So, uh, Wednesday evening at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, we have a live stream teaching series with a rude awakening called the Sword of Yehovah. Right now, we're going through. Uh, right now, we're going through the chronological Gospels, which is an amazing resource, an amazing tool for anyone that uh, is interested in getting that. Um, it's just where you get to. It's where you get to see the the day by day linear, you know, chronological events of Yeshua's life and ministry, because as it turns out, it's actually only the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the only one that wrote his Gospel in chronological mm. sequence. Uh, the the other Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and John, they, you know, they have events over here, and then, a, you know, an event that is supposed to come at this point in Yeshua's ministry, but they wrote it at an earlier point, and um, the chronological Gospels takes the four Gospels and sorts them in that 70 week ministry the actual uh, linear chronology I've enjoyed and I, I just I think it's 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 really fantastic because when you understand the context of the when and the where of where Yeshua is and when it is in the year uh, of his ministry it helps you to also understand so much clearly so much more clearly the why why does he teach this here at this location at this time oh that's why, because you know it, it correlates with location and time. Um, nothing concerning Yeshua's ministry is by accident. It's 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 the year of Yehovah's favor, uh, as Yeshua reads from Isaiah chapter sixty-one when he's in the synagogue at Nazareth, as recorded in Luke chapter four, that he was sent by Yehovah. He is there doing the will of Yehovah. It's it's God's work. It's God's word. It's God's mission. And Yeshua is there to fulfill it, um, and so yeah, that's what we do. Um, that's and exciting. so, just want to you know be be a blessing to you know whoever you know God would have me wow, be. Wow, <laughs> I love it. Did we? Okay, uh, maybe just one more then for you, just to make sure that we ha have the full answer to if Mormons come to your home, the young the young guys, or, and and knock on the door and they want to talk. Is, is there any? <laughs> What would you say to help maybe put a seed in their minds that they can go research? What would is anything going to penetrate? Should you even try to, or should you just try and be friendly? Well, yeah, I I tell you, you have to start with genuine friendship. You really do, because if you if you just outright criticize like their beliefs or ridicule their beliefs, then those those defensive barriers, those walls will come up 
so fast and they are they have been constructed very very diligently constructed by the LDS church deliberately through their indoctrination those walls are high and very thick so there and may be nothing reaching reaching them that way through like one conversation is i certainly will never say that that that's impossible because with god all things are possible but i'm gonna tell you that the likelihood of you reaching mormons that way on your like first meeting with them hey sitting them down and just being like hey you believe this guess what that's false yeah <laughs> you're really, you're not going to be successful. You're just not going to be successful. But if you start with friendship and you're willing to just listen to what they have to say, they're going to share a message with you and you're going to know it's got some truth to it because if it, if it was all lies, well, then Joseph Smith never would have been successful at deceiving anybody. Satan through Joseph Smith never would have been successful at deceiving anybody. You... There had to be some truth to it because it has to, it has to be. It has to resonate. With um, soul. It has to resonate with people who even you know have a love for God and a love for Christ, obviously. And the, you got to think about the context. This is the United States of America in the New England area in the 1830s. Everyone's a Christian. Everyone's a Christian. Everyone knows their Bible, or at least you know knows a, a lot of the Bible. Joseph Smith is used by the enemy to deceive these people at that time, and so when it comes to the Book of Mormon, there's plenty of truth in it, but it's laced with very subtle false doctrines that are designed to get you to trust in Joseph Smith, and then trust in the leadership of the LDS Church, and join the LDS Church, and you get on a path that ultimately leads you in that direction of full-on indoctrination. And, and spiritual darkness. Mm. Getting to reach Mormons, like those Mormon missionaries that will undoubtedly, you know, be knocking on your door at some point, start with the friendship and have it be real. Be, be, you know, sit there and lint, listen attentively to what, you know, they have to say. Again, knowing there's going to be some truth that they're going to share, but it's going to be laced with, you know, some false doctrines and lies. They don't know better. They genuinely don't understand them that way have a have a empathetic and loving heart towards them in that way it's not their fault they're just kids i mean these are 18 year olds you're, you're going to be talking with however after that initial meeting invite him to come back invite him to come back and begin that process of actually establishing a friendship where little by little each time they arrive you open up the bible and you share with them what you know to be true from the Bible, and one of those the the foundational things that you can really open up the mind of a Mormon to is the importance of knowing truth objectively. As you know, I spent all that time you know before you know talking about is Mormons don't think that way. Mormons genuinely believe that if you're going to determine something as being true, like something's true from God. You have to pray about it. You have to have this spiritual confirmation, the spiritual experience. That's what's going to be, that's what's going to confirm to you that it's true. And they're going to invite you to do that. Those Mormon missionaries, they're going to, you know, want you to read the Book of Mormon. They're going to want you to pray about the Book of Mormon. They're going to want you to pray about Joseph Smith. And that's where you can step in and say, however, the Bible doesn't teach us to do that. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches us, like, where, where in the Bible can we point to and say, hey, do I need to pray about the prophet Isaiah, or the prophet Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or Habakkuk, or Malachi, or Samuel, or Moses? I mean, where, where in the Bible does it ever teach that I need to pray to know that this individual is a prophet? Yeah, good point. It's... And that that can help a Mormon to to recognize it's well, they they may even and this would actually be the best thing for them if they have a, a mind that recognizes that and they go you know what I'm gonna have to go look for that and they themselves go search for it because I tell you the biggest thing that you could ever ever hope to do in the life of a Mormon is just get them to question what they've been taught. If you can get them 
to question what they've been taught, even to a small degree, that is a starting point. That's a very, very good starting point because if they question it, which in and of itself is, is going against what they've been raised to do, they are raised never to question Mormonism, never to question its, dar- its doctrines or its leadership. So if you can, you know, they'll, they'll present you with some doctrine of Mormonism that you know is false, and if you don't attack them over it, because once they get defensive and emotional, it's over. You're not going to reach them. You're just not going to reach them. But if you can help them to see from the Bible, that's not what we're told to do in the Bible. We're told in the Bible to objectively test these things. Let, let, let me show you an example. Let me, you know, let's open up here. And, then, and this, of course, requires us to know God's Word. We have to do our due diligence. We have to know God. You're, you're, when it comes to like what Yeshua says to the disciples in Matthew 10, as I talked about earlier, that you will, in the very moment you need it, you will be given what to speak, what to say, because it'll be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. You, you can only do that if you have actually put forth the effort and the work to get God's Word here first. <laughs> like, you have to actually get the Word of God here and here. You have to know it. You have to, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, that you you have to be ready always to give a defense for the reason of the hope that is in you. That requires effort. That requires work. That's our responsibility. We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. We need to know and understand the Word of God so that in that moment when a Mormon missionary is sitting on your couch and says something false, you have the ability to open up the Word of God and say, but what does it say here? You see, this is this is an issue here. See, it's, it's, it's not the same. It's like you can only shoot from the hip if you have a gun. <laughs> That's right. It's like if you don't have the... If you don't have the screwdriver, you're not going to be able to, you know, get that bolt in. It's just not going to work. You get, it's like you got to have the tools. Yeah. If you don't have the hammer, you're not going to be nailing anything in. You have to have the tools. It's so, interesting. Like it seems to me like the Torah, Torah observant Christianity, whatever you want to call it, has this grounded in objective truth thing about it i mean the torah itself that that must have been what partly opened your eyes to the realizing these tests realizing oh i can't be subjective and i feel like mainstream christianity you know can have that can edge towards that weakness of subjective ultra spiritualizing because it doesn't have the counterbalance of the objective torah and and so totally yeah well this is and and this is the thing that's so sad about mainstream christianity really in this last generation or so is that mainstream christianity has been going further and further towards not the word but the world and this is where we start getting all these christians uh so-called christians that start saying things like my truth and it's like there's no such thing as my truth and your truth. That's a lie. That that's moral relativism. That that's you know that goes back to the same lies you know that the serpent is saying to the the woman in the Garden of Eden that you you can you can take of this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and you get to determine what's right. You get to determine what's wrong. You get to determine the moral order. You you know you don't have to listen to the lawgiver. You know, because, you know, even though God, did, did God really say that you'll certainly die? Oh, you will not certainly die. You can do whatever you want. You can actually determine these things. And a lot of Christians, so-called Christians, they've been deceived, totally deceived, just as the woman was deceived by the serpent into this 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 lie that things can be determined subjectively, that you you can have your own truth and other people can have their own truth and even if those contradict each other that's perfectly fine that's their truth and i have mine no you can have your opinion but that's not the truth <laughs> the truth is going to be the truth and moral relativism is will lead any individual or any group 
if they continue on that path to its intended destination, destruction. Everything about the Bible, everything about it is objective. It's always objective. You test these things objectively. And that can really help a Mormon to understand that because something that a Mormon is is taught, this is right from the Book of Mormon, right from the first book in the Book of Mormons uh, called First Nephi. It's First Nephi chapter 13. First Nephi chapter 13 literally teaches that the Bible can't be trusted because there's been these direct quote, plain and precious truths that have been removed from it. And Mormons believe that there's been like whole sections removed, whole chapters removed. and Like, you can't trust the Bible because it's been mishandled and misinterpreted and mistranslated. And, and, I, and I certainly won't deny that there can be an issue here with the translation or an issue there, because all translations are going to be interpretations of the translator to a, deg to a degree. You can't get away from that. But if you're looking at the original manuscripts, which we have full access to, and if you're looking across multiple translations, then you can get to an exceptionally accurate interpretation as to what the Word of God is saying. More than that, we have over 40,000. Once again, this is all objective. There's nothing subjective about any of this. We have over 40,000 manuscripts of the Holy Bible that have been found, either full manuscripts of certain books or partial manuscripts if they're older, or fragments of manuscripts. And every single one of these 40,000 plus manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts, when they're tested, the older manuscripts tested to the more modern manuscripts, 99.9% .9 of all of it agrees perfectly. It's worded identically. And, and, and Mormons have this idea that over time it's just been altered to such a point and such a degree that it's it's lost so much of this truth and these plain and precious tr things, and it's just objectively false. That's just an objectively false statement, and that's one of that's yet another foundational belief of Mormons, is that you, you can't trust the the Holy Bible, and that's why we got to have the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, and you got to have these 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 modern day prophets. Because you can't trust what God, you know, said and how it's, as it's been recorded in the Holy Bible. If you can just get one of these Mormons just to question their beliefs, just to question a little bit, that is a powerful, powerful seed in their life. If that gets planted in their heart, God can use that, and and it it will it'll take time. Like, do n never expect. Never expect a Mormon to come out from Mormonism in the course of a few days to a few weeks or even a few months. It's just not going to happen. It took me diligently searching. I mean, I was diligently searching and striving and digging deep for the truth, like continuously. It still took me a grand total of what would be eight years to fully get out of Mormonism. It started in 2010 with that prayer, and I wasn't fully out of Mormonism until the late summer of 18. I mean, it takes time, a lot of time. You, Mormons have been so conditioned and so brainwashed and indoctrinated over such a long period of time that you can never expect those chains to be broken like that. It just is not going to happen. It takes time. It takes effort. And you can be the tool in God's hands to begin that process in the life of you know one of these Mormons. That's great. But it, I think that. But it has to. It really does have to start with that friendship. That you have to. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche phrase, but things are only cliche because there's truth to them. Um, it, it's the phrase that you know they they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you can show these these Mormons, the Mormon missionaries, whether you encounter them on the street or whether they knock on your door and you invite them in and you know sit down on your couch, until they can see that you do genuinely care about them, you're not going to reach them. They just don't care, or they, they've been conditioned to to not to any argument you throw at them that is that they can see is against their beliefs. They've been conditioned to just completely shut all that out. They've been they've been raised to shut it out.
I mean, it's it's literally taught to all Mormons that if somebody if somebody is criticizing the LDS Church or its leadership or its doctrines, then you know that that somebody is lying. You know that that somebody is is an agent of of the devil, and you, know, you are just to shut them out immediately. You don't listen to anything they have to say. And I hope I hope hearing this will help equip some people who who they visit. Um, looking back. On after this wild journey that you've been on, are you glad that you left, and are you glad that you found the truth? Yeah, glad is um, is an extreme understatement. Yeah, it's um, I I truly do give praise to God daily, whether it's verbally, like I verbally tell God, or if it's just from my heart and soul. I I give praise to God daily that he brought me out of that false man-made religion. I truly do. I am so glad, I am so happy and so thrilled because again, it doesn't matter what tribulation you're called to go through. In hindsight, if if you've been raised in darkness and you're brought out from that darkness into the light, you can always look back, and I do. I look back and I go, I don't even recognize that person who I was. You know, it's like, and how, and how I was so utterly deceived. It just, it, it's mind blowing. And yes, I understand how it happened. I understand why I was deceived. But coming out, it's like, <laughs> it's like coming out from bondage. And yes, there are those types of people, like you think of the Israelites in the wilderness, that there were some of those Israelites, they wanted to go back to Egypt, right? They wanted to go back to the bondage. But for those people that value truth, that truly have a, a hunger for righteousness, the righteousness of God, you're brought out from those chains, from that iron furnace, and you look back and you just give so much praise to God that he brought you out from that. And even if you have to, and not just if, when you go through your your wilderness wanderings, your your time of testing and tribulation, you do ultimately enter that promised land. And you're in that promised land spiritually and mentally and emotionally and psychologically. And, and it is a land that flows with milk and honey, <laughs> if you will. And yeah, I, I look back on my wilderness wanderings, and it was tough. It was very, very hard. And I even look back further than that to my time in bondage in Egypt. And now that I'm in the promised land, I'm, I'm just nothing but pure grateful. It's just complete gratitude to the Almighty. So yes, I'm glad. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, okay, then where can people find you? We'll link it all below. They probably already know, but tell, tell us. Okay. Uh, the primary place where you can, you can find me is now with this ministry that I'm now with, and that's A Rude Awakening International Ministries. Uh, their website is A Rude, that's R-O-O-D, Awakening, arudeawakening.tv. That's the website. But uh, hey, just type A Rude Awakening into YouTube, and you'll find the, you'll find the channel. Uh, that's the primary ministry, but I also have my other ministry that I uh, said earlier, the Sword of Yehovah. And that's youtube.com forward slash YHVH sword, YHVH sword. And um, yeah, I would say that that's the, the two primary locations where you'll find me. And uh, so many teachings available and, con and teachings that will continue to be made available for God willing many years to come. So, Jay, there you go. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. This has been a pleasure. Oh, Luke, this has been so fun. I This has been great. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. And um, I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, until next time, man. Until next <laughs> right. time. Hey, you know what? I need to have... We need to do this, but in the reverse. I need to have you on a, a rude awakening sometime so we can get you know your story. So anytime, you just count on anytime. that happening. Katie might want to try and come with me, but anytime, man. <laughs> <laughs> really do appreciate it, Luke. Thank you.
I created a Patreon so I could kind of help support this thing. But what it has morphed into is a f incredibly fun once a month digital gathering where we all, all the patrons and I, get together and talk about the Torah, talk about our lives, talk about questions we might have, problems we're running into. And so if that sounds like something you are interested in, or if you just want to support the podcast, then join our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash thelifewithluke. Thank you so much for watching.